All right, welcome everyone. As mentioned, today we're gonna to be going over information protection and threat intelligence learning as it relates to the zero trust model. So we're going to start with the data and we're gonna do a crash course in zero trust. And just in case anyone's not been attending these previously, so they get a rough understanding of what it is that we're talking about and then how protecting your data ties into the zero trust model. All right, so to start, those who don't recall, zero trust is a security model that assumes no implicit trust for entry. Uh, unlike the previous kind of castle and moat strategy you may be used to around security, where you really only limp, worried about your public facing services, your DMZs, as hybrid work and everything's blown out and everybody's needing uh, access to SaaS services and monitoring of management of remote devices, a new security paradigm is obviously needed. Zero trust is that new kind of paradigm. The short of it is, is that you assume you're already breached. And at every access point, you're taking as much telemetry data as you possibly can to make those kind of access decisions at the time of request versus that kind of castle moat strategy where pretty much if you have someone's account and you know where the VPN is listening, you're already inside the network and can do whatever you want. So it's a much, much different approach. Um, keys here, though, is to implement zero trust effectively. Organizations obviously need to have a comprehensive and integrated platform to provide such a thing. Uh, Microsoft 365's excels at that. Now, in fairness, though, that is because they get to control so many different aspects of the device's data, identity, et cetera, but we'll kind of get into that. And just to provide a much bigger, more technical kind of picture of how all this kind of plays together, I'm going to show this before we kind of dive in. Uh, this graphic's really just illustrating how those kind of telemetry data points are evaluated at the time of access. So again, even if it's just checking email, which you would think would be a very straightforward thing, there's actually a lot of telemetry data being processed in the zero trust model before allowing that access. That would be everything from where they are. Is their device up to date? Are they meeting compliance standards, conditional access policies that may be in violation of? What's the machine risk score? Is what they're accessing sensitive? Is there any type of step up off in place, et cetera? So that's the general idea. Um, and it allows you to have much more segmented data and a lot more security. And in the uh, event of a breach, much more limited impact. So we are going to start with information protection. Now, information protection is a very interesting one is a lot of people don't have their heads kind of wrapped around it, but the short of it is, is it allows you to apply labeling to your data files and have certain policies, procedures, or effects happen on those files, as well as tie into alerting and notifications of them. So that could be anything from enforcing encryption on sensitive information. It could be triggering DLP policies. If something, for example, that you didn't want to leave your environment were to attempt to leave your environment, and that's something we use here at Plow, for example, and I'll actually be walking you through uh, an example of that. Uh, let's see. As well as it for enforcing encryption, for example, on any type of policy fi uh, file types that would meet your criteria applying watermark, sensitivity, or even preventing access. But we'll kind of run through all those kind of options uh, in a live experiment here very briefly. All right. Also, one more note, this is not only limited to 365, although it, like many things within the Microsoft world, it is much easier to implement around the files and data within 365, but it can be brought onto on-premises as well because the uh, labeling is actually stored as metadata on the files themselves and is not a configuration like cloud configuration has to be checked. It is part of the files themselves. So you can actually do this off print, offline as well. And we'll kind of get into that as well. All right, so let's get going and let's go ahead and give you just a crash course in, DL in sensitivity labels. Then we're gonna kind of pass into DLP policies and a few other things. Let me uh, first make sure that we're actually promoted and pimmed up. I'm pretty sure we are, but I'm gonna double check. Anyone who's not aware, PIM's Privilege Identity Management. Uh, basically, no one here at Plow is a admin. Uh, you basically have to request it and it has to be approved. But I'm pretty sure I did one prior to this. I'm just going to make sure. Yep. Uh, all right, so there's all of our roles and my active assignments. Okay, so I am currently administrator. Good deal. All right, so we're going to navigate to purview.microsoft.com. Now, Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, loves to slam all the administrative interfaces together. And as soon as you get used to one, they're going to rename it and slam it into something else. Um, unfortunately, it's just part of the Microsoft way. You get kind of used to it after a while, and most of the time, they're you kind of agree with what they're doing, but sometimes they move stuff right after you figure out where it's at, and it's a little annoying. But that's what we're here for, so we're kind of running through all this. This is the new Microsoft Purview portal. You can kind of see that we're currently using it, and we're going to be going into information protection. So the way information protection works is with this general term called labeling to flush out this labeling label a little bit more. 
there are different types of labels. You have your attention labels, you have your sensitivity labels, and those can be used uh, in different areas around 365 and to do different things. Um, so we'll kind of get into that. The implementation of these is as such. You create a label pretty much defining what it should apply to in terms of scope, who should be the administrative unit so you can control it and when it should apply. But then you also have to create a label policy. And the label policies actually determine who gets to use which labels. And that's a little counterintuitive until you kind of run through it. Um, that isn't very obvious. But what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm running through one that uh, we use here that we're currently doing with a transport rule that's going to be swapped into this label. So, for example, I have a label here called internal only. Now, this label is meant to be uh, used to designate emails, files, team chats, anything within our 365 environment that should not leave the Plow organization. Now, the way these labels are applied is if you're in any office application, um, let's say, for example, I have a Word document open or I have a my email address open, or sorry, my, my Outlook open. And let's say I'm going to uh, create a new email, which let me get this over here. So if I were to create a new email, I have this option up here to apply a sensitivity label to tag it. And you can see here, those are the three labels that I currently have. If I were to mark this as internal only. This would apply either the settings that I have specified for that or anything that could be pivoting off of that label, which we'll get into here shortly. Because like everything Microsoft, everything kind of touches everything else. And so you are able to kind of modify these labels to do certain things, but we're going to get into that because I actually purposely have not finished our internal only DLP policy block, and that's what we're going to be making today. So what we have here is we have a existing label, and I'm just going to hit edit on this real quick just so we kind of see the settings here. Uh, we were able to basically just find the name of it, what it will be used for, the colorings you need, what areas this should apply to. Uh, certain ones, for example, you may want to go into Azure, but it's going to be much, much more complicated conversation. Others are going to be really targeted toward files and emails or anything within your Teams or your SharePoint sites. These are your kind of automatic applications. This is where if, for example, you wanted to create a sensitivity label for um, encryption, such as sensitive encrypt, uh, this is where you specify that anytime this label is applied, it's going to encrypt. And you're also able to specify the settings within that, but I'll kind of go into that here shortly. But on this one, we're just actually going to leave these blank because we don't need any additional headers or footers. We also didn't, don't necessarily need it encrypted. The only thing I'm really worried about is that this cannot leave the environment. Auto labeling is a service used where you're able to define rules to automatically apply these labels. Um, when we kind of get into, we don't want this sensitive information leaking, or if you have anything private, um, for example, source code on our side, now granted ours is in GitHub, and that's where our policies are. But if you have source code, um, any type of files that really don't want anybody being able to see, but you have so many, you're not going to be able to go back in there and kind of label them yourselves. Highly suggest looking at auto labeling because you can actually define your certain policies and settings. I'm sorry, the criteria that they would have to match and they will be automatically labeled for you. So if you do have a large amount, I would highly, highly suggest using this. Although fair warning, this is pretty much where the kick up to a higher license goes. I'm actually really good at knowing about what where that line should be and you know, they put it right there on auto labeling. So you're able to use this on most E3 services as well as business premium SKUs with the exception of the auto labeling. Um, for auto labeling, you need to go move up to an E5. All right. Lastly, let's see here, we got, uh, we're gonna go and finish this and save the label. So now that that label's created, we now actually have to assign it to people because all that really did is define where that label can be used and what automatic action should be automatically taken when that label is applied. So after we create our label, we then have to have a label policy. Label policy are where you define which labels are available and to who. So for example, in this policy, uh, in that case, let me go step by step. Admin units, it's just a term for the subsection of users that this would target that are able to modify and can always kind of control these rules. So if, for example, they're encrypted, they can strip it out, et cetera. They can also control who this applies to. Uh, but that is an E5 requirement. This is currently scoped to just myself. Because again, this is the actual policy of who to apply those labels to. 
You can also force things such as they must provide justification to remove a label or lower its classification. So that's really important. If, for example, if I'm creating an internal only label and I send out an email that I want to make sure no one can possibly resend that back out, it's easy enough to have a block for that in DLP policies, but you still need to make sure that no users are able to remove that uh, classification because otherwise they'd be able to remove the label and then just send it out as they see fit. Same with any OneDrive type files or any kind of sensitive information you may want. So that's what that's for. Let's see, require users to apply a label. I don't necessarily suggest doing this unless you're really headstrong in this. That's going to basically make every email and every document that anybody ever makes that's scoped by this policy have to apply a label on there. Now, granted, you can set a default, so that's not terrible, um, but just be somewhat mindful when using that. Let's see here. Have not gotten to play with the Power BI piece of this yet. So I'm going to come back to that one and provide users with a custom help page if they're not entirely sure how to actually use labels in your organization. You can kind of spell it out for them. And then lastly, we've got the default label to apply to documents, emails, and meetings uh, as it relates to here. So as I was mentioning that if you are going to use that, everyone has to label their documents, at least apply a default for them, because um, otherwise they're probably going to hate you very quickly. All right, so we'll just get through these since we're not doing meetings or fabric. And lastly, it's just our name and then we're going to finish it. So what that did is it created just a general blank label uh, called internal only. And then we also had a labeling policy scoping that as well as the other two labels to just myself. So that's within about 24 hours, all your Outlook clients, your Word clients, your Excel documents, all of them will start having the sensitivity button up here. And that's where you're able to, lay, to um, label them accordingly. All right, so let me just kind of give you another example of that. We have it. So for example, I'm gonna do a word one real fast. Let's just say uh, we get Copilot to write us up a, oops, uh, let's just say write a quick summary on um, data loss prevention. And let's say this is going to be a relatively sensitive item. What we can do is we can come in here and go to our sensitivity labels while that's writing it. Ah, I actually removed it, didn't know that. And we can label this as say, for example, watermark, and that's gonna put a watermark on the back of our documents. And with those same policies, you can set it to alert you if someone's trying to remove it, as well as um, preventing online access to these files, which let me actually go back into those labels and show the file granularity on these real fast. So let's just create a new one. I have call the same thing. And same description now. I know why they're all the same. Yep. And we're going to just do files. And we're going to do encryption on this one. So these are the individual encryption settings. And again, this is kind of buried within Microsoft stuff, especially if you're used to third party mail applications and their encryption settings and they're like blatantly right in front of you. Um, this is where you can generally set up how, for example, long uh, offline access is, how long access to that data is. So for example, if this was our encryption one, um, by saying it's sensitive and encrypted, I can say apply those permissions now to it. And then after the, that label is applied, it's only valid for 30 days. Anybody else that this is sent to will not be able to access that email after 30 days. So this is where you can kind of put those kind of time limiters around. Uh, how long they're able to access either files, emails, Teams files, et cetera. It's all based on the scope and then your actual settings within. All right, so let's uh, get out of that. All right, so we showed watermarking as well as the encryption piece. All right, and as mentioned, uh, you can use the source code, other sensitive documents, basically anything you can actually uh, label accordingly as you're making them. While we're talking of labels, this is going to be a little bit sidetracked. I want to make sure I point this out just to ensure no one does this by accident. There are multiple labels um, that exist. Uh, we just went over sensitivity ones as it relates to information protection. But there's also retention labels. Uh, retention labels are a replacement for retention policies within Exchange. Um, anyone who's not aware, retention policies basically specify how long emails have to be kept within that mailbox. Um, before they're either moved off to archival, before they're deleted automatically, et cetera. Um, that's been replaced and superseded by these uh, retention labels so that Microsoft's working on kind of bringing all of this into one place, which they call purview. So you can kind of keep an eye and tabs on it. So just be somewhat mindful of that when you hear labels, 
know that it can actually range from anything from your uh, sensitivity labels to retention labels to encryption labels, et cetera. And it's really depending on the policies that you make around those labels that determines what happens. So it's also very important to, to remember because, again, a label is nothing more than a bolted on metadata onto that email or onto that file within OneDrive that O365 will, will act on accordingly depending on what your settings are. An example of that would be is if I had a OneDrive file, made it sensitive, encrypted, said it could only be ran for 20 days or only open for 20 days after I created that and then sent it out. That file would, would have an encryption link in the email where the user would have to validate who they are before accessing that file. And then once that time range was out, the file was gone. They can no longer access it, even if they actually have the physical version of it because of that metadata. So now we're going to get into the neat parts of how, why you would want to kind of label this and what you can kind of do with it past that. So for this example, what we're going to do is we're actually going to make this internal only uh, notify myself when anybody were to violate it. So that if I create any, uh, any document, file, team, channel, SharePoint site, doesn't matter, and I label it as internal only, how do I prevent that from leaving my environment? So that's where we kind of get into our data loss prevention. So what we're doing here is we have uh, two kind of standard policies currently uh, within our DOP. These are just ones that are uh, created using default templates. Um, let's get actually into the templates. DLP. And I'm not going to go too, too far in DLP. I'm only using this as an example of kind of showing you how labels can be used in other areas than 365 to greatly uh, increase their applicability to your current use case. So with our DLP policies, uh, Microsoft includes tons and tons of already um, kind of financial markers in terms of identification. Now, most of these are just regex for those corresponding values, um, such as GDPR. Um, which is wildly applicable if you're dealing in Europe. But we're going to be doing a custom policy since we made our own label. So we're going to say that this is internal only violation. Okay. I'm not currently running any admin units, but again, that's just who would be the administrators of this group if you wanted it to be a subsection and not just like your global admins or your security personnel. Um, this is going to ask us where we want to apply that policy. Uh, for this example, we're, we're just going to do emails for now so we can get this verified. As you can see here, on-premise repositories also in here as well, SharePoint sites, OneDrive, et cetera. And we're going to hit next. And now we're going to create our own custom rule. Now, this part's a little unintuitive, but that's what we're here for. So we're going to create the rule that this would actually classify it as. So we're going to say the name of it's going to be internal only labeled files or email. And then the condition, and this is what I was talking about, that's a little unintuitive because you would think you would have a option right here of this label is or is labeled by, et cetera, but it's actually inside of content contains because it's Microsoft and why not? Right above content is not labeled. So you think they'd make that a little bit more intuitive, but alas, they did not. And then underneath that, we actually have our actual sensitivity labels that we've seen created here. So I mark that as internal only. And turn a quick summary. So basically, if the content contains any of these labels, such as internal only, what do we want to do with it? Well, uh, we're going to forward it to, let's say, me for approval. Because if someone's trying to leak something I have said that they cannot leak, I want to know about it. Uh, so for these measures to prove specific approval rules, we need to add our approval person. So that's going to be me. And this is where we can either notify them uh, that they violated this. Yeah, let's probably do that so they don't, you know, think they freaked out. Uh, policy tips is also very useful because policy policy tips will actually show up above uh, the in the email client. So if, for example, they see that internal email and they go to forward it externally, the policy tip should show up and actually say, "I wouldn't do this." And that's also where you can let them know that it's going to be sent off. It will actually trip alarms, et cetera, depending on what you're trying to do with it. And then lastly, do we actually want to create an incident about this, which we'll get into threat intelligence and what the difference is between incidences and alerting is. Um, but this is where you can basically specify that, yes, this is like a high priority or a very sensitive thing and go ahead and send an alert to all the admins as well as these other people. And that's pretty much creating a DLP policy based on a label that you had made in information protection. So you can see when it goes somewhere you didn't intend for it to go. 
Uh, so we'll just go next. And then lastly, we can run this in test mode just to uh, see if it works. We turn it on immediately, et cetera. All right. So that's using information protection policies and DLP policies to alert you if anything anybody tries to run off with data that you don't intend them to do so. And again, this applies to everything from sharing in SharePoint to e email and external people to, I mean, you can obviously get very, very granular with this. And I think that kind of granularity makes it a little bit difficult for people to wrap their heads around because Microsoft makes some interesting choices in terms of uh, their designs to make this not that intuitive, but I kind of understand it because they're trying to slam so many different things together. All right, so let's just run this in test mode. And while that does that, we will go ahead and Pause briefly for any kind of questions around sensitivity labels, around information protection in general, uh, data loss prevention, anything really around kind of securing your data. All right, so now let's go to the fun one. All right, so next we're going to be talking about uh, threat intelligence alerting and touching on threat intelligence in general. So threat intelligence is a feature helps you detect and respond to malicious activities uh, targeting your organization. It's actually a collection of multiple solutions. Um, again, going back to that zero trust model, what we're really doing here is looking for all this telemetry data to make a decision. Are we already compromised? Because we're assuming we are. Uh, if so, what evidence do we have for that? What are our actions we need to take for that, et cetera? All right, so let's uh, let's get going. Uh, let's see. All right, we are going to be running through alerts and incidences. We're also going to be creating one, and we're going to be modifying policies so that we can kind of show you how to quiet this down because right out of the box, it is rather noisy. Um, my theory is Microsoft didn't know which ones you'd actually want turned on, so they just left them all on. But we're going to walk through kind of turning ones off and quiet it down a little bit, and more importantly, how to actually make the alerting that you actually need to be aware of. Uh, Microsoft did a good job of giving you 98% of them, but uh, there's always ones that you may want based on your existing your current organization's use case we use threat intelligence alerting to investigate the details and context of each alert uh, such as the affected users the devices the data involved uh, as well as where they're coming from and all basically all that telemetry data and all of it kind of feeds into the security.microsoft.com this is still being worked on slash in progress slash they're still merging together a bunch of stuff so keep that in mind as I kind of show you where the alerts are currently configured because they're in a couple of different areas, but they are working on putting them all together. Um, the way they did so, I'll kind of walk through with you here very shortly. So let's start with um, instances and alerts. Uh, very simply, um, alerts is obviously a rule that has been triggered, either that has caused a raised status within your tenant. And that could be anything from a... Uh, let's say a unknown user logging in from an unknown location or from an anonymized VPN, uh, too fast travel would be like identity related. It could also be though coming from Defender for Endpoint and it could be machine risk scores, it could be uh, antiviruses, malware has been flagged, et cetera. Those are all individual alerts. However, uh, when looking at like an attack chain and an attack timeline, what Microsoft is really trying to do is kind of bring that telemetry and those alerts together to kind of give you one single quote unquote incident to work on. And so that's what the difference is between an alert and an incident is an incident is a collection of alerts forming a timeline versus just an alerts like this one person got access to a mailbox. That may that may trigger an alert if you have that enabled um, versus an incident would be much more like this person was sent a phishing email and then they went and changed somebody's mailbox permissions that's going to look like more like an incident because you would have two alerts there. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to go kind of into these alerts and we're going to, and instances, and we're going to kind of uh, go through how to control what alerts show up, what to do with them, uh, what the different types are, and how that kind of relates to zero trust. So for example, I have uh, two instances here. I have one of email messages containing a malicious URL that was removed after delivery. Uh, one very useful thing about Microsoft's anti-spam solutions and their zero trust models is because they are used by the vast majority of organizations, they have way more telemetry data than any other provider in the world, by far. Um, and most people don't realize they actually employ more security personnel than any other security company in the planet, but it's not here nor there. So what's really cool is that when a new attack email kind of comes out and gets sent and it hits a bunch of people within 365, 
as soon as enough people, and this is kind of worldwide, report that in or say this is a problem, it gets flagged pretty much for everybody. What Microsoft will do is actually use Zap and go back in and remove those emails from other people. Anytime that happens is when you get this mess, this alert, that email message is containing a URL that they've determined uh, should not be there. And so it was removed after it technically hit their mailbox. So that's what that alert is. But that may not be something you actually want listed here because it isn't something for you to act, actually act on. So, and you can actually see that in my uh, email, for example, I have the email from them right here for this. So let's just say I'm, I don't want to get these anymore because there's not really an action there. It's just letting me know that one fell. So the way this is controlled is if you look into each incident slash alert, you will actually see the source of where those are coming from. So for example, this timeline and this alert, uh, MDO, yeah, I know where that's at, but I was hoping it was a little more intuitive. So MDO is your email policies. I really wish they'd change the name for that one. Um, but that will generally say either defender for endpoint, that will say threat intelligence, that'll say threat detection, they'll say antivirus, they'll say XDR if it's um, their, what is it? Uh, I can't remember what it stands for. I'll look that up here in a little bit. Um, but that'll basically tell you where that's kind of coming from. Because again, this the security panel is really a collection of everything from Defender for Endpoint, Defender for O365, Defender for Cloud Apps, et cetera, et cetera. All, all 20 defenders that Microsoft has, which I'm sorry, that is the dumbest nomenclature I've ever heard of in my life. All right. So let's say I kind of don't want to be getting these all the time. What I'll need to do is come over here to our policies and rules your email collaborations and go to our alert policy and this will basically list everything that's kind that will trigger an alert based on your current configuration so let's give a second it's gonna take a minute mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right so these are for example all the alerts that are currently coming in and again it's everything from if someone in your environment granted mailbox access to someone else it's going to get tra triggered and if you obviously if you don't want to see those, it's where you can hide it. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to go down to our an email message containing malicious URL it was removed after delivery. And we'll go to this one, which is just an informational one. And we are going to uncheck mark it so that I no longer receive those alerts because Microsoft's already removed the email. There's no action items here for me. It's borderline noise. All right. And that's pretty much the entire list of your email ones. Now, as I mentioned, in terms of these alerts and Microsoft trying to put them all together, each of the alert policies are actually in their corresponding areas with the overarching exception of this general alert suppression. And what I mean by that is Microsoft is currently slamming these different Defender products into the security portal and rebranding it as Defender XDR. And as such, there's now a new notification layer on top. And so inside of here, we have our alert tuning. Now this allows you to basically create a rule that supersedes all other uh, alert policies and rules on those individual products to basically say, I don't wanna hear about this one or that this one needs to be much more important. Um, and you can kind of see here, you're able to select where those are coming from. So if for example, my internal only policy I'd made if I told it to go and trigger an incident because I need to investigate why someone's trying to leak um, sensitive information outside the organization, I could, for example, set this to actually trigger a much more serious alert, ramp up the who it goes to, copy other people on it, for example, um, and basically act on it. Uh, so that's pretty much how you can create your own, I'm sorry, to adjust your own alerts so that you filter out certain ones. If for example, let's say you wanted Microsoft for identity and you wanted, uh, let's see, uh, trigger, we need a filter. Where are we, where? Condition, yep. So we're gonna trigger it off of Defender for Identity. If the trigger is equal to, this is where you kind of get into per person suppression. Uh, there's actually, let me touch on that real quick. You are able to label identities, uh, your users. Um, with certain labels as well. For example, our executive staff here are labeled as high priority, and we can actually specify certain alert suppression rules or even certain alerts to kind of pivot off of that. Um, so actually, let me kind of get an actually a good segue into actually creating your own alerts. So let me go back to 
our learning policies. So let's say, for example, I don't want to know whenever someone reports um, a junk mail unless they are like an executive, for example. What I would do is I would go in here and actually disable email reported a, a user as junk because I don't need to know of everyone's. But I would then go in here and create a new policy. So we're going to do high priority reporting. And we're just going to label it as low and we're going to call it threat management because that would be accurate. All right. So what we can do is the activity is let's say user submitted the email as either fish or junk. And then we're also going to add that our user tags our priority account. So in this example, I'm creating a alert that basically says, I don't care if the general uh, users report something as junk because Microsoft will kind of sort that out when enough reports come in. But if an executive or someone mark marked as a high priority reports a phishing or a junk email, that might be something I want to act on. And this is how you can kind of create different alerts based on that criteria. Uh, and again, this is 100% dependent on your organization. Um, and then lastly, we have here, how do you actually uh, want to match this up? You can also set just when it becomes weird. So if this is something that actually happens relatively often or even every once in a while, and you just want to know if it starts happening a lot, such as mailbox permissions um, would be a good example because every once in a while, especially during terms, you may need to adjust those mailbox permissions. But absolutely at no point should there ever be more than like you know, one or two of those mailbox permissions firing in a single day, for example, then that'd be a good example of how you could use that to only identify if someone's doing something that's not out of the norm. All right. So that is creation of alerts. And we also went into how those are handled, where the different sources can come from. Again, you got your device threats, identity threats, your email threats, your security threats, all those coming from those different aspects uh, on this model. So data be a good example. DOP policies would be firing. Uh, malware antivirus should be your threat protection here. Um, uncommon uh, location or unfamiliar sign-in properties or too fast travel or token used in a place that wasn't issued that would fall under identities. But you kind of see how here just to access a single file that we're taking all that kind of telemetry data, we have policies built around those aspects to kind of do whatever we need to do uh, to protect our data and devices. All right, let's see. So we already kind of went into, oh yeah, so let me actually run through one of these. I have a investigation kind of up because the incident I had shown was a kind of weak, weak sauce one as it was purely just a, we removed an email. So I actually have a much more interesting one. And this is from a, one of ours that, added a Google Chrome extension that they should not have. So, I don't know, but I found these results on search. I mean, never to say uh, the G word next to uh, Google devices. All right, so this is a incident um, that I wanna kind of demo just to kind of show you threat intelligence and how the kind of these pieces kind of all fit together. Uh, we have seven alerts here. And again, an incident is just a collection of individual alerts. So let me get these unfiltered. Um, so we have a walk attack malware that's been detected and a low reputation arbitrary code and a service that's been launched that we don't really see all that often. So we have this attack story that kind of brings in those alerts, their timestamps and when they are all involved. We also have everything from our assets, um, the device they're on, all the individual Exposure levels for them is current risk level, uh, the user itself as well. Uh, for example, if they are investigating priority, if they're currently high risk, anything like that, I have nothing there. And then last we have our actual investigations. Uh, these are the alerts that have actually been fired and what they were triggered from. So you have EDRs here that are seeing that low codes being ran versus the malware was actually found by the antivirus. And lastly, this is the really cool part, we actually have everything um, that was related to that trigger. So this is everything on the machine, what process was running, when it was running, what it did um, to trigger this, even all the way down to the command line. This is something that I don't think many people understand. Defender for Endpoint is not a joke. <laughs> uh, I have not seen really any other antivirus that has that type of granularity to the point of we had an alert trigger on a uh, a file being created on the root drive on one of our development laptops uh, while we were demoing. 
uh, Black Point, uh, which is a SOC service. And the they use a ransomware detection, and so they put canary files around uh, the machine and actually watch those to see if ransomware touches them. Uh, Defender for Endpoint actually picked up on that service, putting those files in those locations and flagged it, and we actually hunted it down because we were, had to make sure it wasn't something more serious. But we had that type of granularity. We had the timestamp, the process, where the file was, all of it, and all of it within here. Uh, makes it much, much easier to chase down serious things. All right, and then lastly, we have our actual summary. This has been resolved and all the evidence involved. So that is an example of running through an incident. I'm gonna to touch briefly also on general threat intelligence and threat analytics. Um, and I'm gonna to touch on this briefly solely because these are very, very important pieces that you should be investigating periodically in your environment, especially if you're on Defender for Endpoint because so much of this telemetry data is available to you. For example, in threat analytics, we have uh, anybody who keeps up with security stuff because they're nerds like me uh, may know this one. But this CVE of 2024 21412 was released uh, very recently, it's about a week ago. Um, as you can kind of see here, uh, we have, according to this, 13 devices within our environment that may potentially still be vulnerable to this. Uh, this is very useful information in terms of ensuring that you don't have any active instances related to it, because again, Defender will try to piece all this together in the incidences. Um, but we're able to come in here and basically see uh, which ones of our endpoints are actually exposed to that and what the vulnerability is for it. So for example, we have eight Windows 11 machines, five Windows 10, and I can actually come into this and find um, the machines that are directly related to it. So. Very, very, very useful information uh, for threat intelligence, or I'm sorry, threat analytics around threat intelligence. Uh, let's see. Also, the other main one I'm going to touch on real quick, you know, we're not really focusing on devices, but again, I cannot stress this enough. Your vulnerability management within here, absolutely valuable. Stay on top of your application uh, that need to be actually uh, updated. So for example, I believe we need to push out an open SSL update across the board here. Yep, man, we have 12. So this basically will list every kind of Chrome on Mac. We have 11 over Mac users that need to update their Chrome, even though we do have a gem policy to force that. So I need to go investigate that to ensure why these are not fully updated. But this kind of gives you a good overview of all of your telemetry data, how it kind of relates to zero trust. And again, each device having its own score all relates into the conditional access that you can specify. So with that in mind, I'm going to go back to this and just kind of summarize what we've talked about so far. So those have, have been with us for conditional access and PIM and actually Defender for Identity. I can recall the identities piece to this. We've also gone over kind of endpoints, Defender for Endpoint, keeping your devices up to date, how machine risk scores involved, keeping your updates and how to chase down people who aren't updating the OS, as well as using your vulnerability assessments within security to identify applications that need to be updated. Because again, it's not just operating systems that can be exploited, it's also applications, um, especially ones like browsers and whatnot. I know we do we do all the fancy sandboxing and stuff of browsers nowadays, but still it's one of the most common ways to compromise. Then we also have our threat protection, which is checking all the incoming email. It's also checking uh, any, of the, any of the files that are uploaded to your OneDrive, SharePoint, et cetera. All of that's getting analyzed. And then lastly, what we covered today as well as data and the labeling of them. Is this sensitive data? Is it need, does it need to be encrypted? How long should people be able to access it? Who's allowed to strip off those labels and how are things labeled accordingly? So as you can kind of see, once you kind of get all of these pieces in place, it's actually rather difficult to do anything out of the norm and not trip something somewhere because you're either accessing it from somewhere that that person normally doesn't or you've infected his machine uh, or you've gotten hold of files and data that you're not supposed to. Any of those are going to trip this. And that's the entire idea is that we are assuming this is already tripped. 